Okay, so uh, then, uh, then a guy named Harder came up with a two Poisson model, and the idea there is, well, a single Poisson doesn't fit, so we're going to use two Poissons, right? We're going to use one of them for the head and one of them for the tail. And it's actually a nice idea. It, uh, it, uh, it, it, it works in many, in many domains, and the way he described it is he said, well, uh, for each document we're going to have two sets of terms, right? We're going to have elite terms, and these are words that occur unusually frequently in this document, like art arc. Right? So words that usually should be very, very infrequent, but for some reason they're frequent in this particular document. Maybe it is about artworks. Uh, so, uh, and then you have non-elite words, and that's your linguistic glue. Those are your stop words, the offs and the ends and the thes, <clears throat> and, and they occur as expected by chance. And the document as a whole is a mixture of the two Poissons, right? So you have the elite Poisson and the non-elite Poisson conditioned on the eliteness variable, right? And you have uh, uh, you have an extra parameter for for determining the amount of mixing between the two Poissons. So that's your probability probability of eliteness. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, you do have an extra parameter, and you have to estimate these. Uh, you have to estimate uh, two means because you have two Poissons now. No. Okay, so that's great. Uh, he came up with uh, with this not for retrieval, but just for describing the word occurrences in the documents. Uh, and then uh, Robertson and Spark Jones, the guys who were working on the probabilistic model, they decided to adopt this as a way of bringing frequencies into the probabilistic model. And, um, um, but what they bumped into is this eliteness. It's a corpus-wide measure, right? So it's, it's, it's the same measure for the entire uh, corpus. Um, so it's not really the same thing as relevance. So uh, they decided that what they needed to do was condition E, the eliteness variable, on uh, whether you're in the relevant class or non-relevant non class. Um, and, uh, and the problem is the final model ends up having way too many parameters because now you have E conditioned on R, right? And then depending on E, you have mu1 and mu0, and, mu and you have the same set of parameters for R. You have one set of parameters for non-relevant class R equals 0, another set of parameters for R equals 1. Um, and at the end of the day, you bump into the very same problem that they bumped into earlier, right? Uh, and the problem is you can do something if you have examples. If somebody gives you examples of relevant documents, then you could estimate something. But if you have no examples, you can't estimate anything. Right? Just like in the classical model, they ended up having to make a silly assumption that uh, query words are going to occur you know, in half the relevant documents. You have to do something like that here. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. <clears throat> so uh, what they did here is they took, uh, they took an a very interesting and very impressive leap of faith. And this leap of faith basically goes like that. It says that if you, this is what you want to estimate, this is the quantity that you want. So uh, DW is the count, how many times the word W occurred in the document. So we have, uh, we want to compute the probability of that happening under the relevant class over the non-relevant class. And uh, these probabilities of zeros, they're the normalizing factors. So that they come from dividing by the zero document. Remember what we did to constrain it to just the words in the document. So I, uh, it was assumption, uh, assumption three or four. <clears throat> so that, that's why these guys come. So uh, the the leap of faith that they take is they say that this quantity is approximately that quantity, right? Um, and. Uh, <clears throat> And you can stare at it all day long, and you won't see any you won't see any logic behind this. Well, uh, there's a bit of logic, right? This part, the QW zero over QWDW, you know, that's what we had earlier. That's the idea of components. Uh, but but this part, where does this come from? Uh, it is it is a leap of faith. Uh, so you could say it is an assumption, uh, and basically it's an assumption made out of desperation. Uh, in order to estimate these guys, you need examples of relevance, and you don't have any examples, so you say, well, we're just going to we're just going to estimate them in, in this really, really bizarre way. <clears throat> so if you do that, of course, uh, you end up with um, a nice formula. So uh, this is your squash TF component, and it has some extra parameters, k and b, um, document length, average document length. That is our normal ITF component. Right? So when you put it to, all together in a big model, then uh, it ends up looking surprisingly like the TF idea of weighted sum that we had in the vector space model. Uh, it's a little bit richer. It has a little bit of extra room to, to wiggle with, but the form is pretty much identical. So what do we have? 
Uh, now, this corresponds to the log of the ratio, right? And you can always take the log because it's monotonic. Uh, so the product becomes a sum. So you have a sum over the words. And this means that okay, the, more, the more words you have in overlap, uh, the better it is. This is your TF component. And it has the same form as before. Number of times the <coughs> W occurs in a document divided by term frequency plus a certain constant. <coughs> uh, so that, that's the squashing. That, uh, that, that accounts for the bursty nature. That means that the uh, subsequent occurrences of the same term are less important than the first occurrence. Uh, and that is just our IDF component. Uh, so that says that the frequent, word are gonna, frequent words are going to be less important than um, unfrequent words. Right? And it has the same performance as the, uh, as the TF-IDF. I guess well, one big difference, so you have some extra parameters here, k and b. And by tinkering with them, by playing around, uh, you can get this model some Sometimes this model will eke out a slightly better performance. Yep. I was thinking about that particular way of putting the parameters in. So basically, you're asking why that? Yeah. A leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there is. Uh, trust me, there is a lot written about the classical model, and um, it is a leap of faith. Uh, really, it is a leap of faith that comes out of desperation. They have no way to estimate it, so they do it. All right. Okay, so uh, here's an example. I'm not going to run through this. This is how you would compute BM25 for, uh, for, for a particular document, so go through that. All right, so let's summarize. We talked about the probabilistic model. Uh, so the big thing there is if you can estimate this guy, if you can estimate the probability of relevance, you're all set, because that's going to give you the best performance. Uh, and then the classical model is trying to somehow estimate this probability of relevance uh, given the document. And we made some assumptions, so uh, prominent assumptions, words are binary events, uh, and this is relaxed in the two Poisson model, the BM25 that we had on the previous slide, uh, and you're assuming that the words are independent. It's not an accurate assumption, but uh, nobody, nobody has any way of, uh, of, of doing any better than assuming uh, independence. <clears throat> so what are the nice things? It's formal. Um, it's interpretable. Um, it is an explicit model of relevance. So if somebody gives you relevant documents, you know what to do. Uh, the, the real ugliness is what happens when nobody gives you any examples of relevant documents. And that's, and that's where the model falls apart. And uh, they basically come up with heuristics to approximate things. All right. So uh, 